my name is Simon Downs. Uh, I am head of infrastructure at the student room, and I'm going to be talking about how to level up as a developer. Uh, as an early warning, this talk is highly opinionated, being as it is based almost entirely on my kind of background career path, people I've met, uh, things I've encountered, etc. Um, it may or may not surprise you to know that there isn't really a definitive guide for how to level up. Uh, you kind of have to figure it out. So what I'm hopefully going to cover tonight is some ways and things that you might have encountered before or maybe you haven't thought about um, that will help you do exactly that. Uh, so quick bit about me, because um, everyone likes talking about themselves a little bit. Uh, so yeah, I'm head of infrastructure at the student room um, where I do AWS -E cloud stuff. Uh, previously, I was a development manager. I've been a developer. Um, I haven't done QA. Um, there we go. Uh, I also uh, am co-organizer of Brighton Cloud. Um, so if you're interested in cloud stuff, check out our meetup page and join that. Uh, I'm also uh, an RF Air Cadet instructor. Um, and also I play a far too many computer games. Um, so. There we go. So uh, we're going to talk about leveling up as a developer. So the first thing we probably want to discuss is what is a level? Uh, so you could go from the kind of the classic job titles, junior, developer, or level, senior, lead, um, which are kind of taken from my CV. Um, so at some point I held those job roles. Uh, you might have the, I say, they used to say fancy, um, but they're not really fancy. Um, they're kind of just like the the more big tech job titles that you might see over in Silicon Valley. Um, so like associate engineer, senior staff engineer, senior staff principal engineer. Um, so these were taken from Circle CI's engineering competency matrix. Um, there's a site called uh, levels, no, progression.fyi, uh, which lots of and big engineering companies have exactly this kind of thing. Um, it's like their career path for developers. Um, or you might look at it from a, an overall knowledge or experience point of view. So are you a beginner? You know, I'm sure we all were at some point beginners. I think some, in some ways I still am. Um, all the way novice, intermediate, proficient, advanced, expert. Um, they're a bunch, a bunch of words that I took from the dictionary, um, which kind of highlight levels. Uh, Jeff Atwood um, of uh, Stack Overflow fame, um, if you haven't heard of him. Uh, he also has a really cool blog called Coding Horror. Uh, he wrote an article many, many years ago of the eight levels of programmers, um, which when I was Googling this talk, well, topics for this talk earlier, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, came up and I thought it was quite entertaining. So I thought I'd share. Um, so his eight levels of programmers, starting off at the bottom with the bad programmer. You write code, but you really shouldn't. Please stop. Um, hopefully that isn't anyone in this room or watching at home. Uh, you may or may not have worked with someone like this. Um, I think maybe I have once. Um, generally, they tend not to last very long because they get found out. Um, you have the unknown programmer, competent but unremarkable. Coding pays the bills. Yeah, so this might be the stereotypical uh, big industrial company programmer sits in a really big corporate office um coding away nine to five does the job goes home watches netflix uh the amateur programmer who has a genuine enthusiasm for coding and tech um including outside of work so they might do their job uh, and then go home and write some code for fun might be in the same language different language play around with tech but you know they've got the kind of interested in it beyond the nine to five aspect which i given that we're at a meetup, we probably assume that everyone in the room is kind of at this level uh, at the very least. Um, the average programmer. So you're kind of good enough to know you're not great and may never be, but that's okay. You know, you're kind of comfortable in your own skin. I'm good. I'm not the best. I'm not the worst. Um, I'm definitely not that bad programmer. Um, and I'm kind of comfortable with where I am. The working programmer. So you've got a successful career as a dev, you're always in demand and kind of you're respected by your peers. I think that probably applies to a lot of people in the room as well. You know, I think you get to a certain point, especially if you're just going to meetups, like you kind of already have a successful career. Um, hopefully you're respected by your peers and your colleagues. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's kind of a, the, maybe the, the standard level, maybe. Uh, the famous programmer. So you're famous in programming circles, 
people have heard of you, you're making an impact. Maybe you've written a book, maybe you're big on the conference circuit. Um, I would say the meetup circuit, but I wouldn't definitely not classify myself as famous in any way. Um, uh, so yeah, you, you kind of that next level up wider community. People have actually heard of you. If you went somewhere random, people, Oh, that's you, uh, the successful programmer. So you're well known. Uh, and you've also created a business out of your code. So maybe you started a startup, um, maybe you've just solved a particular problem and that's kind of now you get to do that for your living, uh, but you get to choose what to work on. You know, you've kind of like, you've, you've done your programming, you've turned it into a business, you've made a bunch of money and I just kind of get to do whatever I want. I'm going to work on some interesting tech stuff because I can. Um, and then finally the dead programmer. Um, so you're part of the permanent historical record of computing other programmers study your work and writing. Um, so maybe, you know, not only have you got a Wikipedia page, um, but people write books about you. Um, so, you know, that kind of level, which one are you? Um, there isn't a single answer to what level is. Um, it's kind of down to you as individuals to kind of decide what level do you want to be? What level do you think you are? So the real question to ask is where do you want to be in three to five, 10 years time? Um, and funnily enough, when you start thinking about that, it's kind of time to have some kind of career plan, um, or a vague idea of where you want to go. So the first thing to do is to think about where are you now? Then just to think about where you want to be. What are the intermediate steps? And then do them. And then over that period of time, you will end up hopefully where you want to be. If only life were that simple. So where are you now? Besides that's a meetup. Um, think about what are you good at? What are you great at? What are you bad at? You know, what are your individual skills? What are your individual competencies? I don't know. Um, what do you enjoy? What do you tolerate? What do you hate? So, you know, if you think about your day jobs, which parts of it do you like? Which parts do you go, mm, oh, I'll kind of do that if I have to. Which parts do you like? I really don't want to do that anymore. Um, you know, I think we're very fortunate in tech that certainly from my point of view, I think a lot of us get to do what we love, um, which is great. There's also some downsides, but I think generally the positives outweigh those. Um, but it's good to think about what aspects of your role um, you enjoy, tolerate, and hate. What are your family or financial commitments? Because um, that's going to have an impact on what you can and can't do and the decisions you can make and the steps that you can take in your journey of leveling up. And the key here to be is to be honest, but not overly critical. It's not a self-bashing session. Um, it's not about um, putting yourself down. It's just about being honest about this is where I am. You know, good, bad, indifferent. This is this is where I am. Now I can start planning where I want to go. Where do you want to be? So first thing, what level? Well, we've spoken about level. Um, could be a level of uh, competence. Could be a job title. Could be, uh, could be anything, you know, you've kind of got a defined level for yourself. What kind of role do you want? Do you want to be a developer? Do you want to transition to a completely different role? Do you want to be an engineering manager? Do you want to be a CTO? Do you want to run a business? Um, what kind of role do you want to end up in, um, or aim towards? What kind of company? Um, anyone working a big multinational? Anyone working in like a, 10 person or below startup, small thing. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, what kind of company do you want to work at? I've worked at big corporate. I worked at SMEs. I worked at a company where I was the first hire that wasn't a schoolmate of the people in the room. That was an interesting interview. Um, being it was the first one I'd ever done. Um, so what kind of company do you want to work for? What size company? Uh, what industry do you want to work in? Um, do you want to work in finance? Do you want to work in just I say tech. Um, do you want to work in um, I don't know, engineering, sales, marketing, healthcare? You know, what kind of topics besides the technology side do you excited about? Um, I'm very fortunate. I work at a company called the Student Room. Our focus is young people. Um, I'm really passionate about working and helping with young people. Uh, where do you want to work? Do you want to work? remotely at home? Do you want to work in an office? Do you want to have to commute? Do you want to be a digital nomad and go and work from a beach somewhere? Um, 
having cocktails. Um, where? Where do you want to live? Uh, what kind of lifestyle do you want? Do you want the uh, kind of the digital nomad lifestyle traveling around? Do you want to be anchored to one place? Um, do you want to have loads of money to spend on holidays? Do you want to, you know, buy fancy cars? Do you, what do you, what do you want um, your lifestyle to be? Then thinking about what are the intermediate steps? So does your situation allow for radical changes or do you have to make more incremental steps? So when we were talking previously about family financial commitments, um, maybe, you know, that means, okay, well, I'm not suddenly just going to be able to up and leave and go and stay on a beach because, you know, the other half might have an issue with that. Um, maybe you've got a mortgage, which, you know, restricts where you are physically. Um, what you're missing skills and knowledge. So when you were thinking about earlier, what you're good at, what you're bad at, what you're not, are there gaps for the role that you want, the company that you want to go for? Uh, do you lack some industry knowledge, for example, that you need to gain? You know, I don't want to work and go in finance, but I know nothing about finance. Um, is that something you need to look at? Are there stepping stone roles? You know, I want to be the CTO. It's very unlikely you're going to go from junior developer to CTO. If you have, I mean, either you've just founded a startup or done something very right or something very wrong. Um, but, you know, what What are the, the roles between where you are and where you want to be? What do they look like? Do you need to relocate? You know, if you're looking, working, I want to work for a really big company, where are those big companies? They might not be local to you. Um, it might be, oh, I need to actually go and move to Silicon Valley um, or America or somewhere else. Or maybe I just need to move to the beach that I want to go and work from. Uh, and what lifestyle changes do I need to make? Um, do I need to cut down on my spending so that I can then fund other things later on? Um, you know, we're talking about what lifestyle you want, what changes do you need to make to get to that point? Uh, and then you execute, which is the easy part. There you go. Take a picture. Tried and tested. Uh, it's even got error handling. Um, fantastic. Uh, so yeah, basically you just go through the steps in the plan um, there will be issues certainly. Um, so uh, I cheated a little bit because like with anything writing code, I started writing this in code and then went, actually, how do you deal with that? So I kind of just cheated and if there, if there is an issue, we'll return it and someone else can deal with it. And um, which is probably going to be you, you know, just outside of the scope of this loop. Um, so a couple of top tips, uh, find a good recruiter or two. Um, I found them very, very useful. Um, I think tech recruiters generally have a very bad reputation, sometimes very deservedly so. Um, there are really good ones um, that will genuinely care about finding you the, a good role and helping you and advising you on your kind of career path. Build a network, really good place to start. Meetups, um, get yourselves on LinkedIn, etc. Knowing people is really handy for wanting to go for new roles, break into new industries, etc. Um, it's much easier if you know someone can help you with that um, rather than kind of going in blind. Uh, going outside your comfort zone. Um, again, I think something that's really, really important. Um, everyone's kind of, you know, you're in a job for a certain amount of time, you get comfortable where you are doing your thing. You know, maybe you're a React developer. It's cool. I love React. It's great. Do that all day. Uh, maybe you're uh, an infrastructure person. Great. I can do that. Happy days. Um, but sometimes you might find yourself over time, you're too niched and your skills have faded somewhat because you didn't look up and look at what was happening around. So it's always good to be pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. And again, staying current, as I said, like the everyone I think in the room will probably, and at home will probably agree, uh, tech moves insanely fast. Um, I don't think anyone, I, mean, I was chatting to a few people earlier, who, like myself and a few others started out doing Visual Basic 6. Um, does anyone do Visual Basic 6 now? Um, one person, fantastic. I want to talk to you later. Um, yeah, it's things change. Um, and if you want to level up, you definitely need to be changing with them. Speaking of which, continuous professional development, the fancy words for learning. Uh, so I kind of put this in as uh, a thing of not teaching people to suck eggs. Um, we all know we need to learn and can learn continuously, but I kind of wanted to give you an idea of how and what maybe you should think about. So uh, here's one of my favorite questions to running interviews. What happens when I type a URL into the browser and press enter? Now, there's lots of discussion about whether this is a good or a bad question, but I quite like it because it enables both me as an interviewer or an interviewee to express my level of knowledge about a certain thing um, and how 
how much do I know about that? So for example, the kind of naive answer might be, or the simple answer, uh, you send an HTTP request to the server, you get back a response. The browser renders some HTML. And then some other stuff happens where it goes, oh, I need to go and fetch some more things, repeat steps one to three. Cool, yeah, now I've got a web page in my browser. But what about networking? There's a whole thing there, a whole stack. DNS, browser's got to do a DNS lookup first. TCP IP, to do the DNS lookup, it's got to set up a TCP IP connection. How does that work? Uh, how do sockets work? It's probably going to be encrypted at some point. How do you handle TLS? What's that even stand for? How does it work? What's it do? Um, it's not to say you need to be an expert in any, in any of these things, or all of these things, but having an awareness of them so that if you were in the interview, you could talk about, oh, does a DNS look up? Oh, yeah, it's going to be TLS. What about caching? DNS got its own cache. Browser's going to have a cache. CDNs are a big thing. Maybe your web request doesn't even hit your, your uh, actual application, gets nowhere near it. Cloudflare just goes, oh, yeah, yeah, there's the thing that you want. Happy days. Move on. At an application level, have you got a web application firewall that's going to hit? Will it get binned off? Uh, do you have load balancing? Is it going to hit a load balancer? What's the web server going to do? Does it have a virtual host configured? All of these kind of things. You know, so the simple answer of, oh, yeah, the web page appears, does it? But what happens in between? How much do you know about those things? Uh, there was a really great textbook answer to that question on GitHub, um, which I read through and it's brilliant because it starts at the very beginning talking about keyboard hardware and completing circuits and firing interrupts in the operating system, um, which is again, one of those things why I think it's such a great question because you could start doing that. I, I actually had, had that question in an interview and I laughed and the interviewer was like, what are you laughing? And I'm like, I've literally just read the answer for this. And I gave it to him. He was like, that's probably the best answer I've ever had for this interview question. Um, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of each of those things, but I know that they're there. And it's that kind of level of awareness that I think when you're leveling up as a developer, you just need to gain more awareness of those things. You know, at no point is anyone going to, everyone talks about full stack. No one's going to be an expert in every part of that stack. Um, you know, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in even one part of the stack. So I like to think always be learning, um, which I think is key to being a developer and leveling up. You know, as I said earlier, if you're kind of stagnating um, or you're doing the same thing day in, day out, and you're not learning and not expanding your skill set over time, you will effectively become irrelevant um, or potentially really rich, depending on if you happen to luckily pick a tech that is now defunct, that now you get paid lots of money to keep up and running. Um, swings around about. I wouldn't bank on the last one happening though. Um, so how do, how do we learn? Um, I mean, everyone knows how to learn, uh, I would hope. Um, reading. If you Google the top 10 programming books, you will get a whole bunch of articles that will list the consistently at least 10, if not more so books. Quick straw poll, who has read more than three programming books? Okay. Who's read more than 10? few people all right um this isn't to say that to be a, to level up you must go and read these books yeah i, th I look at it in terms of I, like, I used to in my naive days think oh yeah if i read these books i'm gonna become really great and like a super programmer it's not what happens um but what i think it does is it gives you a better understanding of how things work um and different techniques that you can then apply in your jobs it's not going to tell you do these things and you're suddenly brilliant um doing. Uh, I learned by doing. I'm completely self-taught as a programmer. I didn't go to university. I just picked it up going to the library before, you know, the web was really a thing. I'm old. Um, do something. Write something in a different language. Uh, hands up JavaScript programmers. Uh, can you, have you written stuff in other languages? Hands up Visual Basic 6 programmers. <laughs> have you written Python? <laughs> Uh, for example, um, I think it's a really good way of like leveling up effectively, being able to pick a language that's suitable for the problem at hand. Would anyone write a web app in C? There's, 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 <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, you, you might, 
Um, but are there better languages? You know, is is it, do you just pick the language that you know, because you're kind of like, well, I know that, I'm just going to use that. Is it actually the right tool for the job? If you have awarenesses of different languages, then at least you can start asking the question, what's the best language that I can solve this problem with? What's the best tool for the problem at hand? So literally go and try different languages. Um, solving a defined limited problem. Uh, when I was younger in my visual basic six days, I just started to write and imitate things. I wrote like a billion versions of notepad um, and then a billion versions of like some really terrible HTML editor thing. Um, and then when I started doing web programming, I just wrote some really awful websites um, just to kind of explore the problem space and see how they kind of fit together and what kind of problems might occur. Um, nothing to do with my day job. I didn't write notepad for a living, um, but it teaches you different ways of thinking at thing about things. Um, side projects is ring. Anyone got um, side projects at home, like random libraries on GitHub that they look after, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think again, in that instance, ahead of the curve um, in terms of leveling up. It's about having that kind of that passion, thinking about things, doing stuff at home just for the sake of exploring the space um, or doing something different, especially if you're looking to switch kind of your job role, maybe you're doing React and you want to switch to doing backend development, or you're kind of like you're doing uh, backend and you go, actually, I really want to go and do some of this Node stuff and React stuff because it sounds really cool. Or I want to go and write mobile apps, or I want to go and do some really hardcore network level coding in C. You know, wh whatever that is, um, being able to do that at home and exploring things in your own time is going to be really important. Attending in a meetup or a conference, mission accomplished. Okay. Uh, obviously, we're all at a meetup. Anyone been to a conference? Cool. Attending. Next level. Speaking. Who's given a talk at a meetup? A couple of people. Anyone given a talk at a conference? I haven't. <laughs> okay. Um, I would genuinely recommend giving a talk at a meetup. Um, when I first started coming to meetups, I thought, oh, do you know what? All these people that stand up and talk, they must be like really expert at stuff. I am in no way an expert at anything. Um, I just happen to be quite fortunate and probably know a few things, um, I think. Um, and then I'll go and talk to someone and go, I know very little. Um, but giving it, pick a topic, um, something that you know about, something that you want to explore, go research it, give a talk. Um, I run a meetup. Um, every meetup organizer will tell you, Oh, we really want people to give talks, right? Finding people to give talks is the hardest thing about running a meetup. Getting companies to pay for beer and pizza, easy. <laughs> like there's going to be a bunch of tech people in the room. Can you obviously, can we have some cash? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, anyone want to give a talk? No? Okay. Uh, so yeah, you don't have to be an expert. There are meetups where you could do like a micro talk, you know, five minute talk. Um, but it gets you some practice, um, standing up, doing public speaking, talking about something in a different way. Uh, mentoring. Anyone done mentoring? Anyone done like proper mentoring, not kind of helping out the juniors at work? A couple of people. Cool. Yeah. So whichever way you look at it, has anyone, has anyone got a mentor? Oh, yeah, because it works both ways. You think kind of thing, oh, you know, even if you're like a senior person or a manager, um, you know, oh, I don't need a mentor. Well, maybe you do. Like if you're, if I wanted to be a CTO, I'd be going to find a CTO and going, hey, Mr. CTO, or Miss CTO person, Mrs. Uh, you know, can you help me out? What do I need to do? I want, I want to be where you are. Teach me you'll be one. Um, you know, but it's a really good way of expanding your skill set and your knowledge and helping out other people, making connections, building a network. Oh, it's all related. What should you learn? So I was speaking to Steve earlier because um, I gave this talk a couple of years ago and this slide was originally just a whole bunch of tech stuff on a slide and I covered stuff. It was just like, like, basically like the syllabus for a, like a uni degree of like, let's talk about uh, yeah CS fundamentals and algorithms and all this kind of stuff. And I looked at it when I was redo redoing the slides and I was kind of like, there's a lot of stuff on there I don't even know. And I've never had to cover that in my life. So I've refactored it into things that I've come across as a developer in my years. And I would very much recommend other people look at this kind of problem space. And you may have encountered it in some of the things you might go, oh, yeah, I've definitely looked at that. Um, it might give you nightmares. It's one of the things on here definitely does for me. Um, but I think it's a, it's a good starting point. So one of the best things 
I ever think I've ever read on the internet was the original article of like um, falsehoods and uh, programmers believe about names. Has anyone read that? If you haven't, it's absolutely fantastic. We all write systems or applications and we will assume that things are true. We assume people have names. People might have two names. Well, we're going to give them two input boxes, first name, surname. It's not true. People might not have two names. People might not have a surname. Uh, there's a really awesome list. You can Google it. It's just um, awesome falsehoods. It's another awesome list on GitHub. There's a whole bunch of stuff. It will cover names, addresses, dates, times. How many times are they there? 24? Nope. What's the gap between the time zone? One hour? Nope. Are they all different? Kind of. Uh, but it's absolutely amazing. And it really makes you think about when you're writing your code, am I making an assumption here? Is it actually true in the real world? Because as soon as you deploy something where you've made this assumption, you will come across an edge case where that's not true. And someone will, you know, it might be a small thing and you might go, oh, in the grand scheme of things, we're not interested. It might suddenly be the really fundamental thing that was really important. Character encoding. <laughs> this is the thing that gives me nightmares. Uh, has anyone dealt with a character encoding problem before in their career? Yeah, some people are crying already. Um, there's a, another really good article, everything you need to know about uh, character coding in UTF-8. You should definitely read that. I think as a developer, just being aware that not everything is UTF-8. It's really great when it is because it makes life really easy. When it's not, that's a real nightmare. Um, anyone work with MySQL? Or it's the, the similar kinds of things. Yeah, character coding in MySQL is great. Every database can have its own encoding. Every table can have its own encoding. Every field can have its own encoding. Then you've got to talk about collation. The connection and the server can have their own encoding. The application can have its own encoding. When they're all UTF-8, great, happy days. When one of them isn't, good luck. Um, so yeah, having an awareness of character encoding, how it works, um, why UTF-8, you should just use that, just use UTF-8. Uh, time complexity and big O. Anyone heard of big O notation? Yeah, this is one of those things that I've come across, you know, not even really knowing what it was, um, but just going, why is this slow? I've written this really brilliant bit of code. It's really, really slow. Oh, wait, it's because I'm doing, no, I'm going over a loop over an array, and that's got an array, and there's an array, and there's a query. Yeah, so having an idea of the time complexity when we're talking about, you know, how long do these things take to run? Um, they're, again, really good articles. There's a really good cheat sheet on it. Um, you can Google it, big O cheat sheet. Um, it gives you a little graph, visual represent representation of like what's good, which is like two things, and what's okay, which is like one thing, and then what's bad, which is everything else. Databases. Who works with databases? Probably everyone. Uh, how does indexing work? Who knows that? Yeah, the amount of time, yeah, yes, <laughs> a few people were already going, well. Oh. Uh, so the amount of times that as a developer, um, I've come across problems and what's the problem? It's not the application, it's the database indexing. And even now it's a case of, oh, why, why is this thing really slow? Why is our response time shot up? Oh, look, someone wrote a query, but didn't really understand how the indexing was set up. And it's now actually just table uh, scanning 50 billion rows, oops. Okay, um, so genuinely, I think having an appreciation for how database indexing works especially if you're writing queries. You know, if you haven't got to write a SQL query ever, or you haven't got to use an ORM or anything else like that, maybe you don't need to know it. But if you're dealing with databases, I highly recommend looking up how your database handles indexing, uh, which is MySQL's got an explain statement. I think it's a bit, there's similar things in other language or other databases that will tell you what the database is going to do. Is it hitting an index? How many rows is it scanning? Is it doing a table scan? Um, there's a really great documentation page on my SQL website that will explain, explain effectively, um, which I refer to probably, it's probably the page I've referred to most as a developer in my life, just going, looking at this, going, oh, what does this really weird thing mean again? Oh, right, let's tweak that. Containers. Um, I missed this off originally, um, and I was chatting to Yanni earlier, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm kind of doing the containers thing. Um, and actually, when I moved from development to infrastructure, uh, containers was one of the things that kind of pushed me along that path. Oh, this is fun. It's like a, it's like a mini server. Um, but understanding containers and how they use, especially in the world of microservices that everyone seems to be going mental about at the moment, um, you know, uh, they're everywhere. Um, 
I think the most important thing to be aware of from containers is containers, not the same as Docker. Um, as an infrastructure person, when people will say those two things interchangeably, I'm like, no, 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 no not, not the same at all. Um, similar. Uh, distributed systems, again, like, you know, in microservices land, everything's distributed. Um, and uh, has anyone as a developer gone, well, it works on my machine? <laughs> yep. I, I have. Uh, I've worked on my machine, even when I'm running containers. I've got 20 containers for all my services. It works great. Why doesn't it work in, you know, the real world? Because um, everything's distributed. How do you know it's up? Have you put error handling in? All that kind of stuff. Latency. Where are your systems? Are they in the same region? Are they in the same data center? Is there going to be a problem with your network? Um, sometimes you might need to worry about it. You know, maybe you're running a small app. Everything's all together. Maybe it's on the same server. Um, but then when you start moving away from that and adding complexity, you're going to different different servers. Great. Now I've got to think about how they talk to each other. When you get big enough, you need to go multi-region. Okay, well, how do I handle shoveling data and connections and running my system distributed globally? whole different problem you know and the level of difference from your little laptop running some docker containers to that multinational setup massive potentially so having an idea of how that all hangs together and the difference between your system or your local system and how it works in production i think it's really important caching another big one um the amount of times i got burnt by uh varnish um, when I was a developer at a particular website, um, I was like, oh, it's not, it's not working. It's not working. And then my boss would just come along and go, yes, because it's, like, it's hitting Varnish. I'm like, oh, I hate Varnish. Um, and ironically, as a developer, I hate Varnish. But as an infrastructure per person, I love Varnish because it means nothing hits my infrastructure. Um, well, certainly the application. Uh, how queues work. Um, everything in the old, in olden times, everyone used to go, yeah, I need to send an email. Brilliant. I'll just do that whilst um, before I reload the page for the client, before I send them the response. Nowadays, we offload all of that stuff, but how do queues work? Having an understanding as a developer, right, I, I send this stuff to a queue, but what happens to it? How does it, how does it function? Um, what happens when the queue fails? Okay, if I'm sending a, like a registration email or something really important transactionally, how do I handle when that fails when I've already told the person, yeah, I've totally got that. Yeah, no worries. Uh, where's my really important thing that I asked for? I don't know. Uh, it's got lost in the queue. Um, and then finally, kind of replication. There's a really good book called uh, Data Intensive Applications Systems. I forget the name of the book, actually. Um, but it's also really awesome. For I learned a lot about uh, concurrency models, um, how databases work internally. Um, am I going to go and write a database? No. As a, did it make me a better developer understanding that stuff? I think absolutely. Uh, it's not all about tech, soft skills. Uh, I put down a couple of things that I think is really important, especially if you're um, going for higher uh, kind of job roles in the business. So when you're talking like management level, especially if you're going to CTO, uh, but even, you know, even as like senior developers, I think having this stuff just like helps you massively. So first one kind of being business awareness. What does your business do? In some cases, it might be really obvious, but if you're working, it may be in a big multinational. What does your business do as a business? How much does it do? Uh, what are your quarterly, yearly goals as a business, as a department? Um, you know, the kind of stuff that you go in a meeting and they uh, talk about goals and stuff and you kind of go, yeah, that's great. Sweet. Cool. Bye. Um, you know, but like actually kind of internalizing that going, yeah, okay, I understand how what I'm doing benefits those things but also being able to point out and go well i'm doing this how does it relate to that am i missing something uh how do they decide on priorities i'm sure we've all been in a situation where it's like well you should, we're working on this we really think you should be working on this why is that um so understanding how businesses actually decide and prioritize things because you know we can't do everything at once we've got finite amount of money finite amount of people finite amount of time how do we prioritize things and also importantly how do budgets work has anyone been in a meeting or asked their boss uh can i have some money for this tool or this thing and then they turn around and go oh it's not in the budget no all the time <laughs> uh having an understanding of how companies run budgets like when's your company financial year so you're asking for stuff at the right time you know, it's a bit like going, oh, yeah, can we, uh, we want to use uh, this really expensive thing. It's going to be like 100 grand a year. Can we have it? Like, no, you should have asked three months ago when we were planning. And the answer would have been, yeah, of course we can. 
Um, so just having an appreciation for when, how your company runs its budgeting cycle. Even if you're not necessarily involved in those conversations, if you want something as a developer and being able to go to your boss at the right time and say, hey, I know budget time's coming along. I'd really like cool service. Can we have it, please? Uh, communication. Personality types. Who's done a personality test? Cool. Uh, I'm not going to go around the room and ask what people are. It's fine. I'm not even sure what I am. Um, communications preferences. And more, more specifically, what are yours? So uh, one of the things we did at the student room um, not too long ago was a thing called Discovery Insights, which is a bit like a personality test and talks about communication styles, et cetera. Um, but it's really insightful as a person to go, ah, oh, I understand, like, you know, I'm the way I am um, and that's cool. Um, but other people are not like me. And the reason why we have like a bit of tension or a bit of conflict is just because of the way that we both prefer to communicate and we're not getting on, we're not on the same wavelength. So being able, being aware of those things and being able to adjust to different people um, is really, really important, um, especially when you're doing a lot of stuff with maybe uh, people around the business, even within your own teams, I think. So having done, doing personality tests, not for, you know, one, not, it's not one's better than another. It's being aware of who you are and how you're like and how other people are and what differences are and where you have conflicts and why you have them so that you can actually address them and do something a bit different. Teamwork, how to play well with other children. Um, I'm sure everyone at some point has been on a team or in a department or in a company with just someone that doesn't really want to play with the other people properly. They kind of want to do off, go and do their own thing. I know best. Um, I'm the greatest. Um, I'll do it. Go away. Don't talk to me. Um, you can be technically brilliant and a terrible, terrible team person to work with. Um, so I think it's really, really important to appreciate how to play well with others. Um, and I think it's covered nicely with the first two or the two things above personality types and communication, how to compromise and negotiate kind of fundamental life skills. Can't always get what you want. Okay. How, how do you handle that? We're not just throwing a tantrum or telling your boss you quit um, and things like that. How, how can you get people around to your way of thinking? How can you get around to theirs where you need to? Um, and I think something that's probably overlooked a little bit in development land, open-mindedness. I think everyone likes to think, yeah, you know, we're open-minded. Um, giving and receiving feedback. Receiving feedback, especially negative feedback, that's really hard. Yeah. I, and as a manager, I really hate having to give negative feedback because, you know, telling someone that they're not doing what they should be doing, like, it's not great or, you know, how they need to improve. Positive feedback. Yeah, everyone loves that. Everyone loves being told they're great. Everyone loves telling other people. Great job. Fantastic. Um, but how you handle that, you know, if you think you're sitting there and yourselves thinking, Do you know what, I'm really bad at receiving negative feedback um, or I hate giving negative feedback and you manage people like, look at that. Um, I like to think, um, I, well, I say all the time, I have lots of opinions. Um, some of them are very strong opinions, but I also like to think they're weakly held. So I will argue the toss with anyone about anything and go, yes, here's my opinion. This is, this is what I believe to be true. This is how I feel things are. Um, but if that person or someone else presents me with some evidence to the contrary, I don't stubbornly headed go, no, that's not true. Um, I'll go, oh, cool. Yeah, all right. Turns out I didn't know anything. Um, that's a really good point. Um, so it's about that thing of not or realizing that you don't know everything. Other people might present you with new information, even things that were true. Um, suddenly become not true, for example. Um, so realizing, okay, yeah, I'm at that point now. That's not really how things work, or maybe that's not how they worked in the first place. Um, how do we adjust? So quick summary, have a career plan. Where do you want to be? Where are you? how do you get there? Find a good recruiter. Seriously, really, really useful. They're not all terrible. There are some really, really good ones. Uh, keep learning. Um, I think, yeah, you're all at a meetup or attending a meetup online. Everyone wants to learn. Um, well, I hope, uh, don't forget the soft skills, super, super important, especially as you're going to, um, level up to the higher levels, whatever those, whether they're job titles, whether it's, um, being specialists and experts in particular fields, soft skills, absolutely critical, I think. Um, and always be pushing yourself out your comfort zone. Yeah. Don't just settle for where you are. Um, 
my, my wife said to me um, a while back, it's like, you, you've, been, you've been in that job for, for eight years. When, uh, when, you, when you're moving on? Um, and, and weirdly, it's like that's when I kind of actually went, yeah, all right. Uh, I am, I'm not in a rut. I'm having a great time. But maybe it's time that I actually started to level up. Um, and then funnily enough, since I met her and actually took some advice, um, my, my career has leveled up massively. So I suppose the other rest of the step would be having a really good supportive other half because it can just give you a kick up the backside uh, to get going. The end. Thanks for listening.